Hi, in everyday clinical practice, sometimes you come across cases which make you say that, you know, this is going to be a tough one to crack. Sometimes these cases challenge you and you think that uh, all the training you've had and all the degrees you've done and the courses you've done, are they enough for the management of this patient? These patients also look up to you as if uh, you're that last ray of hope and you feel the responsibility and you feel like giving the best of your clinical acumen for them. So I'm going to talk to you about Mr. Rajiv, name change of course, uh, who was married for the last eight years and uh, for seven years, the couple was hopping between clinics, uh, hoping for a resolution to the problem. So when I saw his semen analysis report, three of his reports showed that he's having azospermia. And uh, when there is azospermia, you want to do a complete workup. So on examination, he was a perfectly healthy gentleman and he had a good nourishment. His external genitalia examination showed us that the testes were normal and the epididymis was actually palpable and full. And the vas was also palpable. The hormonal profile which I did showed a normal FSH and a LH was normal and so was the serum testosterone level. I came to a conclusion that he had obstructive azospermia, which of course is a very common question in your MCQ exams also. And uh, the next thing asked in the exam is how do you go about the management? So what did I do for this patient? I decided that probably I can take out the sperms out of his testes with a testicular sperm aspiration procedure and use those sperms for inseminating his wife's oocytes. Now, of course, that's a different procedure in which I have to super ovulate the woman, take out the eggs and then use those eggs for the insemination process. So we went with the uh, testicular sperm aspiration first and uh, here you can see that uh, Mr. Rajiv is on the OT table and now I'm doing the process of TISA. So in TISA, first I have to give a local anesthesia and you can see that uh, with my uh, left fingers, I'm holding the vas and I'm trying to give the local around the vas because that's where the nerve plexus is. And after giving the anesthesia, then I have to aspirate the sperms with a scalp vein set. Now, if you see the scalp vein set here, it is uh, attached to the syringe where I'm going to create a negative pressure so that this tubing here, if you can appreciate the tubing here, this should also have the negative pressure. And with that negative pressure, I'm going to pull out some testicular tissues out of which I'm going to tease out the sperms. So yes, here I'm building up the pressure. Then I apply a hemostat here so that the pressure stays in this tubing. And with a digging out motion, uh, of course, I'm doing this uh, aspiration at one side now, but we do it at multiple places to get more tissues. So with this digging out motion, uh, I'm trying to take out the seminiferous tubules. You can already see some uh, reddish brownish tissue coming into the tubing. And uh, then uh, once this uh, procedure is finished, as I take out the scalpin away from the testes, I do it very slowly because I hope that there'll be some tissue between the needle point and the testes also. That will also be some uh, seminiferous tubules. So I take the seminiferous tubules and put them into a, a petri dish next. And uh, those seminiferous tubules, then we take them uh, under the microscope and then we will tease out the sperms out of these seminiferous tubules. So see here, these uh, tissues have been taken in the petri dish. And once we see them under the microscope, now, you're not going to see a field uh, full of uh, sperms running helter-skelter, which is the normal semen analysis, which you uh, people know very well. This uh, slide, if you can see, has got a lot of testicular debris, and it has also got some round cells, and a very few occasional sperms you see in testicular sperm aspiration. So yes, uh, here you're seeing this uh, sperm here, which is coming out uh, at the edge of the bubble, uh, conveniently for us, so that we can, uh, you know, uh, take out this sperm and use for the insemination process. So these sperms are taken into a very fine needle and uh, that needle will be holding the sperms till we are ready to inject that into the oocyte. So yes, see the oocyte here? This oocyte is held with a holding pipette with a negative uh, pressure and uh, the oocyte is held in a uh, position so that the polar body here, can you see the polar body is at 12 o'clock position. Uh, that's also very important because uh, at the lower part of the oocyte here, this is the part where you have the mitotic spindle. So you don't want to inject the needle and leave the sperm somewhere near the mitotic spindle because that's going to spoil the fertilization. So when we uh, use this procedure this way, we are very sure of doing an insemination properly. So now what we've done, we have injected the needle with the sperm within it. See, this is the sperm. We've injected the needle 
but before we release the sperm into the ooplasm, we aspirate the ooplasm. See, the sperm actually has gone backwards because we are aspirating the ooplasm a little bit because that is going to activate the oocyte for fertilization. Once we do that, then we put the sperm back into the ooplasm. Can you see? It moves and then it's going to start the process of fertilization. So this is the embryo on day three. Here you're seeing the embryo. Uh, it's a nice eight cell embryo. And then you see this uh, embryo on day four where it is a morula with 16 to 32 blastomeres. And then uh, on day five, you're going to see this blastocyst. And the blastocyst, you can see that it's a nice uh, grade one blastocyst with uh, uh, this a uh, good inner cell mass. You know, the inner cell mass is going to make the fetus. And then the trophectoderm, which is going to make the placenta. Now this is uh, uh, put back into the uh, uterine cavity on the day 5 or day 6 of the ovulation. Uh, day 5, day 6 of the oocyte aspiration which is also the day of ovulation, isn't it? So when we do that, we hope that this is going to implant and make an embryo. And that's what happened in this case. Uh, a wonderful site for an infertility specialist. You see this uh, beautiful embryo around 9-10 uh, weeks where you can see the heart beating already and uh, the site which is perfect for uh, us to say that yes you've done a job which has gone off very well and uh, this is what you want to see you want to see that embryo change into this beautiful looking fetus and this is the reward sometimes which you give yourself that yes uh, all that uh, effort you put into your training that can bring some success at least to these couples which are very difficult to manage uh, you know that testicular sperm aspiration and doing a intracytoplasmic sperm injection which we did here it is not a very successful procedure. It's not more than six to ten percent when you have a success with this process. So yes, even if these percent of people you can help, then you feel that it is worth the ride. So like I always say, invest into training, invest into perfect training, so that you can give yourself and these patients some perfect results. All right? Thank you so much.